those who stand on this platform can tell you that the remedy in Guyana is that a new set of people must take over from the old set of people and we will run the system better. That is no solution to the problems of Guyana. The problem is much more fundamental than that. We are saying that working class people will get just only when they take the initiative, when they move themselves. Nobody else can give it as a gift. Someone who comes claiming to be a liberator is either deluding himself or is trying to delude the people. He either doesn't understand the process of real life or he is trying to suggest that you do not understand it. And so long as we suffer from a worse concept of politics as being leadership, we are going to be in a lot of trouble. society at the present time, some specific rights which had been won through struggle by the people in the colonial period are now in the process of being eroded. One takes the most obvious, the electoral process. In Guyana, it is now, I think, widely known inside the country and outside of the country that first of all, the Americans intervened along with the British to abort the democratic process from 1953 onwards. And secondly, that once the present government got into power, it extended the scale of electoral fraud so that we cannot claim at the present time to be a politically enfranchised people. We cannot claim to have chosen our own national government. And that is one level. Below that level, you find that there is reproduced in every facet of the national life the same anti-democratic tendencies. So that there are no, no local government elections, for instance. They have local government elections that are postponed every time they, 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 they become due with, with ease, with, with, with no concern whatsoever, with no reaction. There are no uh, elections taking place within certain trade unions where workers at that basic level should be choosing their representatives to deal with their material interests. And once that uh, anti-democratic principle is established, we see then step by step we move backwards. And I say backwards very deliberately. These were not rights or privileges which were handed to us by the British. The right to have your union and to have a democratic union was one true struggle in this very century. The right to have democratic elections was won only in the late 1940s and in 1963 when there was universal adult suffrage. So that these recently conquered rights are now in the process of being withheld, uh, eroded, dissipated in one form or fashion. In the early years of independence, or the last years of colonialism, we had certain illusions that having inherited the formal modes of political procedure from the British, that of necessity we would not follow the paths that had been followed by other Latin American territories or by countries such as Haiti, and the Duvali, and the Dominican Republic, and Cuba, and the like. And as people begin to recognize that many of these authoritarian traits and repressive institutions uh, can and are emerging in our society, I feel that there is a growing awareness of the need to attempt to combat this repression. One of the significant areas in which repression is taking place is the whole area of the media, the newspapers and the radios. We find that since the government has taken over the papers, it has ostensibly nationalized these newspapers, meaning in the interest of the nation, 
but in practice it is specifically in the interest of the ruling party. As the Prime Minister of this country himself once cynically remarked, he says, the government never tells the newspapers what to print, they simply tell them what not to print. And then they go beyond that. They're not prepared to allow competing centers of information so that they utilize illegal machinery to crush things like the Mirror, the, the People's Progressive Party's newspaper, the Day Clean, which is a new sheet printed by the Working People's Alliance. They had made it impossible for a political organization to print a newspaper. That organization then resorted to mimeographing a sheet but the government considered it absolutely essential to continue to persecute, to, to go to the level of seizing typewriters to make it impossible for people to type and produce a mimeograph sheet. The point is that elements that clearly purport to be anti-socialist are not pursued in the society with the same vigor. So it indicates the direction of, of the attack that is being borne by the government. It's not against uh, reactionary elements, it's not against um, uh, imperialist elements, it's really against anti-imperialist and progressive forces. In Guyana, when we speak of civil liberties and civil rights, people are beginning to understand that the most fundamental of these is the right to work in our society. And what is occurring in Guyana is that the government is making political capital out of the indefensible position of one who is either unemployed or is very close to the line of being unemployed. Guyana is a small country, we have to be realistic about that. It means that if you're unemployed in one area, you don't sort of leave the east coast and go and get a job on the west coast, or leave the north and get a job in the south. You don't leave one industrial occupation and get a job in another. To be excluded from one specific area of employment often means total exclusion from the employment market. And since the government itself has taken over so many facets of economic life, has nationalized the bauxite, has nationalized sugar, has nationalized a number of private firms, justifiably so, it has taken up a position as the principal, far and away the largest single employer in the country. Consequently, the ground is really set for the utilization of this device of uh, the party card of political control by, by means of denying the right to work. And it is a frightening situation in its own right, because in all reality, it is unnecessary to threaten a man's life and liberty if uh, by the fundamental threat to his capacity to earn and survive, you can reduce him to a state of submission. And this is continually what is taking place. It does not appear on the surface to be as frightening as the overt exploitation and oppression of the South African prisoners or the Chilean torture cells or the Brazilian torture cells. But from the viewpoint of the mass of the population in the country and their capacity to express themselves politically, this denial of the right to work is a new frightening dimension of our political scene. Even as a critic of the government of this country, myself and others in the Working People's Alliance would not expect that the economy automatically would transform itself from a colonial economy, from a dependent economy, to an independent, functioning, socialist, integrated economy. We do not expect this because we understand the dynamics of the international capitalist system into which we are caught up. Many people are, of course, fully aware that Guyana has made claims 
after having broken with imperialism or having the intention even of breaking with imperialism. What we find in our actual economic relationship is a very marginal shift for the sake of convenience towards an expansion of trade with socialist countries and a nominal takeover of large sectors of the economy, but not based on a firm commitment to break the ties by which our working class was continually exporting surplus to foreign capital. Consequently, at the last budget, it was evident that the rate of repayment of interest as well as the actual uh, payments for nationalization was so high that it constituted the same drain, if not greater, than it was in the period of direct foreign ownership. This is the sort of uh, contradiction in which we find ourselves partly because of uh, historical forces but also because the class in power doesn't have a conception of where it is going, how it will extricate itself from certain relationships and indeed one wonders whether fundamentally the petty bourgeois class really has a commitment to extricate itself from international capital. Food plenty in the market to kill GMC dumping. Money not ever buy because you're poor like me, you're black like me, and poverty is your legacy. Last election was 64. Duncan then was selection. That's all about corruption. Poor like me, you're black like me, and poverty is your legacy. Yet we have democracy and can do nothing. We have neither the power nor capacity. Code of conduct acts, start cut down corruption trees, limo fall, proper job, libel scandal, they clean in court, mirror in court, you see in jail. Can't get to <laughs> Chinese man, bury the act, renounce starvation, denounce corruption, announce revolution. Cause you're poor like me, you're black like me, and poverty is your nation in a position in which it has to pay in order that foreign capital or foreign multinational interests should still continue to draw surplus from our economy in indirect means. But having put the whole nation in hock as it were, the government goes further. It makes certain distinctions which allow a small segment of the population to pass the real burden down to the vast majority of the direct producers. The key question then, is there any basis for suggesting that the working people themselves are now either in greater control of the processes or are they in a better position to recoup for themselves the products of their own labor? And I would suggest that the answer to that is a negative and that that is the answer which workers give. This is the answer which bauxite workers are giving. This is the answer which sugar workers are giving. And the record is clear in terms of the actions which these workers themselves are taking. We then have to ask, is it that the entire Guyanese nation bears the strain? Or isn't it that a particular segment of the population is itself in a position to pass the burden down to the vast majority? 
they do so in terms of their high salaries, they do so in terms of various quasi-legal and illegal manipulations, either in direct control of the economy or sometimes in conjunction with the small private capitalist sector which exists. The well-known tale of the Raycoffs and the like. Okay. So the political elite ensures that they do not suffer from the pressure which is brought to bear on the nation as a whole. And this is again where the class question comes to the fore. Economic crisis can always be measured in terms of statistical indices. But more important still, people in their day-to-day -day lives will know what it means to be living in a period of economic crisis. The people will know, the housewives will know what happens to be the price of goods in the shop at a given moment. They will know what items are short. They will know how difficult it is to move from one point to another because there is no public transportation or because it is entirely inadequate. And it is really these things that surround and dictate the lives of people. The fact of having to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning to get to work at 8, not because of any great distance, but because of a totally inadequate transportation system. The fact of leaving work in the afternoon and not getting home until uh, the night, precisely because of that same transportation system. It seems to me that in many respects, the working people of the country are showing by the, their actions and showing by their day-to-day -day utterances their awareness of the way in which all these indices are real to them in a day-to-day -day sense. Their children show it in terms of malnutrition. Their old people show it in terms of inadequate medical attention. And one really doesn't say that this is a unique situation which is found in so many parts of the third world. What makes it in a sense unique is that we are speaking in a political co context in which the regime in power makes certain claims, claims to egalitarianism, claims to justice, produces the very fancy brochures which would suggest that there is no such thing as malnutrition, that there is no such thing as starvation, debilitation, shortages and the like, when a glance at the country as it were, a, a, a reference to the living experience of people would show all of this to be false. The crux of the matter is this, the Guyana economy is in crisis, but over and beyond that, the working people are in the greatest financial and economic straits because the burden of oppression is constantly shifted down onto the shoulders of the working people. Guyana is known internationally as a place in which racial strife has taken place. Community violence reached a particular pitch. One of the few third world countries that we associate with racial violence between two non-white peoples. And of course, the government in power claims that since they came to power, since the PNC came to power, racialism has more or less been dismissed in Guyana. The problem has been resolved. The Working People's Alliance challenges that position. We say that far from being resolved, racism has simply been manipulated by the party in power and that it is absolutely essential for the well-being of the nation as, as a symbolic entity and more particularly for the well-being of the working people as a real living being that we should address ourselves to the problem of race and that we should transcend rather than ignore the problem of race. The regime simply goes around papering over cracks, fostering, presenting public positions which claim that there is no racial uh, oppression, that there is no racial discrimination, that there is no sense of racism in the way in which they operate the economy. But in actual fact, they play upon the fears of the Afro-Guyanese masses, they exacerbate the fears of the Indo-Guyanese masses, and in everyday affairs, the manipulation of the courts, the question of granting employment, the structure of the national service, the employment in public services and in all of the armed services, 
in all of these uh, areas of the national life there are day-to-day -day incidents where people of one race or another have cause to feel fear the working people's alliance sees it as one of the principal tasks of our generation perhaps the most overriding task to break the division in the ranks of the working class to overcome that division to create a unity based on struggle not a hypothetical unity not a theoretical unity but a unity based on struggle a unity arising out of the fact that workers who are african in origin or indian in origin at their place of work in their places of residence will struggle for their own material and cultural rewards and in so doing come to a sense of the necessary unity required to achieve their objectives We have seen, I think, some evidence of this. We have seen workers in the bauxite sector coming to an awareness over the years that although they're predominantly African, their principal opponents by no means could be construed to be the Indian workers. On the contrary, that they should call upon the Indian workers to side with them in confrontation with the petty bourgeoisie, even when that petty bourgeoisie is predominantly African. We have seen Indian workers, I think, in recent years becoming more aware of the fact that their predicament is not simply because they are Indians or even because they are sugar workers, but because they are workers and they are faced with an exploitative machinery which includes Indian merchants who will establish liaisons and links with the African petty bourgeoisie in order to ensure that the surplus produced in sugar goes into hands other than that of the workers themselves. My own awareness of the history of Guyana in the colonial period is that the colonial regime trembled whenever African and Indian workers moved together. And on the basis of that and many other facts which can be adduced, I would say that when African and Indian workers move together, the local exploiting class will have a very short lease of life.